Hi, my name is Dr. Emily Bell and I'm a Research Associate in Digital Humanities at Loughborough University UK. I'm co-author with Dr. Melody Beals, who is a lecturer in Digital History at Loughborough, of the Atlas of Digitised Newspapers and Metadata, which was a key output from the Oceanic Exchanges project. For our presentation, we're going to discuss some of the initial findings from the Oceanic Exchanges Ontologies work package, which sought to catalogue and map the metadata terminology used by newspaper databases to one another, and to an internal ontology, to support research into reprinting and citizen-paced journalism in the 19th century. Parts of the wider Oceanic Exchanges project explored specific news stories, such as the eruption of Krakatoa in 1883 and how the news about that spread, and how concepts moved across national and linguistic boundaries. We endeavoured to support this by fostering interoperability across collections. Within the Ontologies work package, we conducted interviews with staff at 13 libraries and digitizers around the world, including representatives from the British Library, the National Libraries of Scotland, the National Library of Australia, and the National Library of the Netherlands. Interviews were also conducted with the publishing companies Redex, ProQuest, and Gale, a Cengage company. Within these interviews, questions were asked about the history, selection processes, funding, and development of these collections. We combined these oral histories with analysis of metadata files from 10 collections, the British Library 19th Century Newspapers, Chronicling America, Delpha, Europeana, which aggregates several collections, the National Libraries of Mexico, New Zealand, Finland, Australia, and the State Library of Berlin, and also the Times Digital Archive. Team members in different countries input the metadata into a spreadsheet, which by the end of the project had over 3,300 lines of metadata fields catalogued. The full dataset is available on Figshare if you want to have a play with it, and includes metadata in three different formats, many different file structures, such as files for alternate newspaper titles, page files broken down into image files and uh, text, files for issue data and so on, and metadata from more than 16 countries, thank you, thanks to the aggregation of Europeana and the remit of some collections to include near neighbours and colonies. Although most of the databases use variants of the Met's Alto standard, these were not implemented in a way that would allow for simple equivalencies. The variance in terminology and in the interpretation of the correct range of inputs for a given field arose from the use of a hodgepodge of different vocabularies, including variants of Dublin Core, Metz Alto, MPEG 21, Premise, and other bespoke or proprietary taxonomies. Overlapping and ambiguous vocabularies were also structured inconsistently, with some combining data at the article, page, or issue level, and others separating the metadata and content for these elements into multiple files. Our initial attempts to account for both internal structures and field equivalencies across these databases made the level of irregularity strikingly clear. In order to explain these metadata fields, we asked our archival partners questions and made use of public documentation, as well as documentation made available to us on request. Sometimes we've had to work out what specific fields mean based on the content, or use forums and blogs rather than official sources, as the initial decision-making is not always recorded. Finally, building upon previous research by team members and our interviews, we were able to develop a longitudinal understanding of how the data has been augmented or repackaged by institutions over the past 20 years. We combined this deep understanding of collections with a literature review of the historical development of the newspaper uh, and the newspaper layout around the world. This gave us our own hierarchy of the newspaper and the metadata, bringing together the logic of the file structures and the logic of the newspaper a kind of ontology, though not the kind we've planned when we started. This has involved defining meta-metadata uh, categories and providing not only technical definitions, but also considering how these terms are used in the academic literature to account for the differences in these metadata fields. Our analysis of these terms in the wild of scholarly discussion of periodicals has shown that the ambiguity of terms within the metadata is often reflected in historical use too. Our initial research purpose allowed one month for mapping metadata fields, based on the assumption that it would be possible, or at least broadly possible, to identify fields with the same kind of data across collections. We'll talk a bit more about why that wasn't possible. In the end, we spent about a year gaining this deep knowledge and designing new ways into the data, such as the linked open data set, which I will discuss later in our talk. Each of these collections was often a lab routine process. Our initial findings for the ontology project therefore relate as much to the storage and structure of the data as the data itself. In particular, we found that although the digitization process had been undertaken in the spirit of collaboration and due diligence had been exercised when making the data accessible and robust, human ingenuity and empathy for the audience often led to unintended consequences.
In terms of the data, the text and images derived from the original newspapers, we found that the material was stored in multiple formats and derived from multiple processes over the past 20 years. Although digitization pilots took place in the 1990s, the majority of the initial digitization programs we examined took place in the first decade of the 21st century. Despite this relatively short period of time and the significant amount of communication between libraries through venues such as IFLA, each program was shaped by differences in in-house experience, infrastructure, funding, and perhaps often forgotten, the ultimate purposes for digitization. Take, for example, Papers Past, which initially launched as a collection of untranscribed images. Doing so allowed them to quickly serve their stakeholders, replicating the microfilm experience at a distance, as well as be one of the first to market, making a considerable impression on international users, despite what we would now consider limited accessibility. Likewise, many of the constituent collections of Europeana remain image only, owing to their early adoption of digital filming before OCR could be implemented for Gothic fonts. Soon thereafter, the desire and ability to provide integrated optical character recognition led to new demands on the digital interfaces and selection and digitization processes, steering projects towards higher quality microfilm titles and investment in hard copy digitization infrastructure and expertise. This latter trend also encouraged outsourcing to commercial specialists with independently developed protocols. Thus, the movement from raw TIFFs towards multiple resolution variants, as well as the development of layout-aware XMLs and derived plain text data of individual articles, was natural. Yet it took place over a single decade, often in the lifetime of individual digitization projects. This led to sharp inconsistencies, not so much in the quality of different parts of the collection, but to the availability of like-for-like -like text and image data within them. The same was true for metadata. The raw importing of basic citation information, title, issue, page, date, was generally considered mandatory. But as processes developed and user demand increased, additional metadata was included, again led by individuals through advisory boards and user feedback, rather than moving towards a standardized correct or complete set of information. Trove, for example, has a significant number of non-METS alto fields, namely its social functions such as comments and tags, but these are not fully integrated into the raw digitization datasets and require careful thought when harvesting from APIs across digitization waves. Other collections, including Trove and Gale, have significant hand-keyed authorial, subject heading, and other metadata that allows users to manipulate and explore collections in new ways but these are not backwards implementable on earlier collections. Again, these inconsistencies are almost entirely the result of earnest attempts to take advantage of new technology and investment to meet user demands. But depending on who was funding these endeavors and who the principal audience was, new inconsistencies were introduced across the data set, particularly if perceived audiences changed from project to project, but all their data was fed into a single digital collection. As for paradigma, this was perhaps the most difficult to find consistency. First, even with the ID or other formal documentation, the datasets could absolutely not speak for themselves, something Emily will discuss in more detail in a moment. We thus absolutely relied upon speaking to the individuals involved with these collections in order to understand the purpose and mindset behind selection and categorization choices. Unfortunately, these providers had a high turnover in technical or technically minded staff, and many of the decisions made had been done under the guidance of individuals with particular expertise or passions. When they left the project or the organization, that knowledge and understanding is simply left with them. Particularly worrying was that our attempts to obtain hard drives or data sets almost always required finding the right person in an organization, not the right job title, and asking for their direct intervention. In one case, the only person who could have packaged the most recent data onto a physical hard drive had left the organization, and the remaining on-site staff were genuinely unable to fulfill our request. In another organization, every single request for data and copyright had to go through one particular individual, and thus he alone knew for certain all the projects currently making large-scale use of the datasets. <clears throat> 
When I asked him what would happen to this institutional knowledge if he suddenly died, he laughed and acknowledged that there was no backup. In the end, the Oceanic Exchanges team spent a great deal of time speaking to former project workers through IFLA conference proceedings and archive blog posts in order to put together a comprehensive history of these projects and the rationales for their eclectic data sets. The ghosts of digitization passed. In our earnest hopes to preserve and present like-for-like -like data, metadata, and paradata across these collections, and hopefully additional collections in the future, the Oceanic Exchanges team devised the Atlas of Digitized Newspapers. This publication and the extensible website version pull together these ghosts and fragments of the human narrative element of these collections, the archaeology of the archives, to borrow a phrase from our colleague Paul Fife. We have made this available in both human and machine readable formats, the latter of which Emily will discuss in a moment. In general, the booklet, available via Figshare or in hard copy upon request, and website contain three major sections, the history of the collections, multidisciplinary discussions of the metadata, and glossaries of terms used by journalists, periodical scholars, library scientists, and digitization specialists to refer to the components of these collections. Although interviews and online documentation for some collections contained additional information on some key areas, we aim to provide the material in like-for-like -like sections of similar depth and clarity. Rather than reduced to the lowest common denominator of official documentation, we scoured the archives and, in many cases, truly annoyed and pestered the holders of these collections in order to provide a complete view, from depositing cataloging standards, to microfilming priorities, to the digitization process, and the development of online interfaces. Although not all the questions could be fully answered with this initial offering, for the first time ever, a true like-for-like -like catalog of international digitized newspapers is available to read, explore, and expand online. As for our machine-readable variants, I hand you back to Emily. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the data set and what we tried to do with it. Here on this slide, you can see a short sample of metadata from the British Library and from the National Library of Mexico. You can see that the Mexican collection includes a standardized date that also gives a time and a date of registration in the database, but that the collection ID also includes a version of the date. Uh, the Mexican collection also tells you if it was a daily or a weekly publication. The version shown here of the British Library metadata, and there are several different versions in their collections, is formatted differently and specifies that it's the printed date, which is itself ambiguous, but it could be inferred to mean the date the newspaper was printed or the date as printed on the newspaper which are often different. It's also true that most archives only digitize one edition per day of their newspapers, and newspapers did change things in um, evening editions and later editions during the day. So the time, while well, it might not seem relevant or possible to specify for a daily or weekly newspaper published 200 years ago exactly what time it was published, can be used to indicate periodicity. If you're looking for morning and evening editions, though, some databases or many databases don't have them, or don't have a way to search them specifically. So as you can see, even from this short example, it's clear that the fields cannot be mapped directly, which brings me to my next slide, which is a horrible diagram, uh, which we made using draw.io and used to try to map each metadata field from each collection into four broad categories. And that's content, um, metadata about the digital object, metadata about the physical object, and metadata pertaining to both. Don't worry if you can't read it here on the screen, that's part of the point I'm trying to make, and you can look at the diagram in our abstract or on our website, digitizingnewspapers.net. So we tried to map all of these fields, over 3,300 lines in a spreadsheet, directly. Our TSV file includes our own categories and subcategories, field names, collection IDs, expats, formats, multiple choice options if applicable, example content, definitions drawn from the documentation, and content types. So we faced several problems. Firstly, as indicated, even fields which seemed as if they might be able to map at the broadest resolution, like date, really contain slightly different content. Printed date, standardized date, date um, as a string, and so on. Secondly, having a team of around 10 different people inputting each collection separately introduced inconsistencies which replicated the kinds of inconsistencies we were seeing from metadata input. Essentially, all the little decisions that we as individuals were making about defining these categories or, in, or creating hierarchies introduced the same kinds of issues as the many hands involved in inputting the metadata originally. 
But with the millions of newspaper pages digitised and continually being digitised, this is inevitable for digitisers. For our team, it meant that we needed a stronger editorial oversight to work through all the collections and ensure consistency. But it was very revealing to us about the kinds of problems digitisers face and how something quite simple can become more and more complicated when there are more people working on it. After working with such disparate source materials, we concluded that the narrative of creation, archiving and digitization might be most robustly and sustainably documented through a decentralized and layered medium, namely linked open data. The possibilities and problems of the semantic web have been theorized since the term was first coined in 2001. In particular, the importance of making and sustaining connections to humanistic forms of knowledge representation has been regularly emphasized. Barry and Fabiord have claimed that linked data involves a fragmentation that, quote, privileges knowledge divided into non-narrative shards of information, which is seemingly in direct opposition to the idea of reclaiming lost narratives of creation and use. But we had, after our interviews, the creation of our report, which draws on these oral histories, documentation, metadata, historical accounts about the newspaper and scholarly literature, several different narratives. The metadata had fragmented them and didn't leave space to add them back in. So we used SCOS, the Simple Knowledge Organisation System, to try to bring those hierarchies together. Our SCOS framework, which is written in Turtle, is not publicly available yet, but here's a, a small snippet of what we've done. At the moment, we've tried to keep it as simple as possible, which is still relatively complex. Uh, we were tempted to use the CDOC CRM categories, or we'll dig into the more complicated relationships possible with doubling core terms, but pulled back when we realised we were at risk of creating a new standard that would be equally unintelligible to people outside our team, or just putting one standard onto everything else. What we've done then is use basic RDF and SCOS vocabularies with some functional requirements for bibliographic records predicates to indicate the relationships. It's possible to go from holding library through database, issue, page, column, article, and so on, all the way down to string, following SCOS broader and SCOS narrower predicates based on the hierarchies that we debated and tested as we've gone through the metadata. We've used our metadata maps as a base so that the hierarchy of the newspaper points to the metadata in an attempt to restore the physicality of the newspaper to our understanding of the metadata. As we've said, these maps are supported by glossaries, which include the history of the term. We've also integrated Wikidata, where appropriate, as a supporting reference which enables users of our data set to find their ways to other hierarchies outside of ours. What the SCOS we've created does then is attempt to bring together technical structures with historical narratives and allow the user to easily find the paradata for these terms. So very briefly, what were our results and what are our suggestions for the future? Well, overall, our results found that the level of detail and databases and individual fields varied considerably. And the range of inclusion of items and level of description was not symmetrical. And this really came from the human element, both in terms of shifting priorities and shifting audiences, as well as shifting staffing levels and people who understood or understood differently how to input this data. The other thing we found was that the data is unfortunately very disconnected. Information from MARC catalog records, which is very, very useful for the physical item, is simply not uniformly connected with the digitization metadata and data, nor is it connected to the histories of either the collections or the titles themselves in any sort of systematic human and machine readable way. And in the end, even though most of these databases did use Metz Alto or some variant thereof, the structures were not identical across the different collections. Moreover, the structures were developed for specialists in various fields, library scientists cataloging for the MARC records, individual historians developing metadata or paradata for HTML enclosing websites, and digitization specialists in the development of METS Alto. And these different systems of organization were not always universally intelligible to the other people who might need to use them. So what are our suggestions going forward? Well, we have lots of them, but in brief, we first think that we need greater support from the existing database providers, not just for providing actual raw data, although that's much appreciated and in fact, much beloved by the community. What we need them to really act as is network hubs, providing some sort of sense of where this data is going, how it is being better developed, value added, and then data passporting or round tripping that data to the original collections. Now, this might be through full integrated systems 
or it might simply be through some kind of interface where data can be pulled in through these paradata and additional metadata collections to make these more robust collections. We also hope that our atlas will serve as the beginning of a centralized repository of contextual data. Much of the information we retrieved was from hard copy sources, whether internal documentations, conference proceedings, or oral testimonies of staff members who simply will not be around forever, at least in their current roles. The more we can put all of this information together, even if it's not perfectly like for like or compatible at the moment, the more likely we are to preserve these various archaeologies. And finally, and I think most importantly, rather than spend all of our time trying to develop metadata standards or data standards or even digitization photographing standards, perhaps we should be thinking more about methodological standards. What type of information do we really need to do the sort of research, whether it's genealogical research, just common human interest, or academic research into these newspapers? What information do we really need? How do we go about putting that together? And how do we go about explaining it to other people? Once we have a standardization, or at least a set of different standards for these different methodologies, then we can take a good hard look at the data and put together a more robust data set in the future. Thank you for watching this presentation. And if you have any other questions or comments, or if you'd like to contribute to the Atlas of Digitized Newspapers, please visit us at digitizednewspapers.net, spelled either the American or the British Commonwealth way. Thank you very much.